Hey, everybody, and welcome to Commercial Construction Elevate the Industry podcast series hosted by yours truly, Dave Presida. Thanks for joining us. The uh, reason for the podcast in the first place is to help you understand the business better by listening to industry leaders who shaped the industry, who have influenced me, and by listening to technical episodes that help you navigate the do's and don'ts and how to's in the business necessary for your growth. I'm not sure where it is you want to go, but wherever it is, whether you're an owner or you're an intern or anybody in between, you can benefit from this series. Now, this episode, we're going to talk about starting a new business. And I almost named this episode Startups. But after I did some research, I realized that, that we're not talking about that. You're in the construction business. So starting a construction business is starting a new business not a startup, and I'll tell you why. Venture capitalists who invest in a lot of companies, they look for major returns on investment. But for startups, the failure rate is 90%. Nine out of 10 companies who start considered startups fail. That's a tough one. So we're not talking about that. Now, why is that? Venture capitalists define startups as having two things in common. One is growth potential. They want a company that is offering something so unique that it could grow exponentially, unlike the linear growth that we have in our business in construction and in most businesses. The other thing would be it has innovation. So innovation, what does that mean? If you're coming to the construction business with a new type of software that's going to do something nobody else done, yeah, I would consider you a startup. Probably not what we're talking about here. Innovation is based on assumptions, right? It's I think we can if very, very different scenarios, but that's the venture capital world. I can tell you this, don't be misled. You're not a startup. You're starting something that other people are doing. You're going to put your fingerprints on it and we're going to, we're going to help you with that. Some key stats that you should feel good about 70% of all construction businesses make it at least through year three, which is a lot better than one out of 10, 47% make it past 15 years. So the stats are with you. The biggest single question you will be faced with, and this will never change, is why you're doing what you're doing. Why do you want to start a new business? And there's a ton of reasons. Maybe it's to build wealth. You want to path through a better lifestyle, time and money, be your own boss. You want to control your future. You needed a challenge. You don't like who you're working for. You say, man, this guy's doing it. I can do what he's doing. A million different things. For me, when I started my business back in 84, well, a couple of those things hit true. I knew I could do what my boss was doing, and I did. But it wasn't about just money, because I don't think money is enough of a motivator for people. Uh, at least it wasn't for me. Maybe it is for other people. But for me, it was a combination of time and money. And that's just a personal thing. But that is a huge, huge question that you've got to answer. You've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt why you're willing to work hard and risk more Okay, because the why has to be stronger than the pain it's going to take to get there. I'll give you I'll give you a little bit of my story. Between 92 and 95, I went to hell and back. Right. And uh, I had to re restructure businesses and I lost partners and things didn't go well. I went from owning three homes to renting a small home. I went from a Mercedes 560 SEC to a 10 year old SUV. This happened in a period of a year. And it didn't matter because my wife was 100% behind me. I had four little kids at the time. They didn't care if they lived in a big house or a small house. They didn't know. So a matter of fact, one more thing happened. I remember it was a kind of a, it was an interesting scenario. I went to an ATM machine and I wanted to get like 40 bucks out of it. So I put the card in the machine. It ate the card. It said insufficient funds. And somebody said, man, that was the low point, wasn't it? I said, no, that wasn't the low point. The low point was when I realized that I had issues and I had to take care of them. And I did. Okay. Some partners just walked away. Others stayed with me. You know, you find out a lot about people when you're going through tough times, but the passion I had about why I was doing what I did got me through it. And once I realized I was on the path forward again, second time was a lot easier Then uh, you know, that's when that I could say I was happy. So your why is, huge know why you're doing this so the next question is what are you going to do now i'm assuming that most people you are listening who are listening uh, are already working for a construction firm most businesses are started by people who leave a company to do what that company's doing 
or to do part of what that company's doing or something that's related. It's natural. It's happened to me several times. I left my company. People have left me. It's the natural cycle in business. So if you're up for it, maybe you're a better salesperson than your boss. Maybe you're a better ops manager than he is. What would make you different in the eyes of your customers? Now, I'm not suggesting you leave your company and steal your customers. That's a whole nother subject. I'm saying that in general, in business, right? Customers have choices. Why are they going to choose you? Now, if you left a big company and you're a small company, I can guarantee you one thing right, right away that you don't have that they do, and that's overhead. That's good and bad. This is assuming that you can finance the business. And we, again, that's a whole other topic we'll talk about. But if all else is equal, why are they going to choose you? Because they like you, because they trust you, because you offer a different perspective on what they're buying, right? The company you left is obviously successful in their own right. They maybe could be more successful. Maybe they don't even know that. But you got to ask yourself, what differentiates you from them? Maybe it's a niche business. Maybe uh, your company you work for does 12 different things. And you want to offer one or two because you want to focus on that. right? Why, why are there subcontractors? There are subcontractors because subcontractors focus on that singular part of the business. They buy it better. They manage it better. right? They're just better at it because that's all they do. If you take a big drywall company, they do 15 different things on a job, but they sub some of that out because they know there are subcontractors out there that are better at it than them. Subcontractors who can give them a price that meets their budget and they can still make a few bucks. So let's say you leave a company and your overhead now is minor. Maybe it's way less than the company you just left. So already you're offering what to your prospective client? You're more competitive. You can do work for three or four points less on, let's say, a 15-point margin job. You can do it for 12, and your overhead is less, and that's the difference. So as long as you can fund it and resource it, right, you add value to your clients. That's that's something that you, you've got to look at. Or, again, talk about innovation. And I, I say it in a way not so much technology-based, but how you approach and market the business. Are you out front with it? Are you reaching more people? Are there different clients that your uh, existing company doesn't even look at? Because now you're different than them. You're different in a lot of ways, and in a lot of ways you're good. And that's nothing wrong with the existing company that you're working for. It's just you're creating your own identity through a new business, and you're differentiating yourself from them. Elevate, elevate, elevate. Guten Tag. Anyway, you'll get that in a minute. I've been in the air battery business for... 20 plus years uh, from when it was a single asphaltic peel and stick impermeable membrane to what it is today. It's a big part of, of the building science. The business has changed. There are several manufacturers in it, but I choose today to deal with Dorkin, a German based company. Not only are they competitively priced, their technical support is great. And mainly I can always count them. They're there when I need them in the field or during the bid. The biggest single differentiator between Dorkin and other manufacturers is they have a simple system. An example, on a previous job, uh, we have five different products to do the same thing that Dorkin gives me with two products. So Dorkin, I thank you for that. My uh, workers thank you, my clients thank you. I would urge you to check Dorkin out at their website, dorken.com. That's D-O-R-K-E-N dot com. How to get started on the right foot. And remember, we're not talking about growing the business. That's a business development issue we'll talk about another time. This is about starting a business. And I think the very first thing that you need to do once you, you've answered the other questions we talked about is you need to develop a business plan. Now, business plan. You might be uh, an estimator or a salesperson and... I can tell you, it doesn't matter what you do, because if I'm a third party and you're going to be showing this business plan to who? To lenders, potential lenders, potential partners, uh, maybe high level employees, they're going to see this business plan. And if you showed it to me, you know what I would look for? Is this person intelligent? Right. And, and I mean that in all sincerity, you're probably you could be very good at your trade. But are you a business thinker? Are you a strategic thinker? 
The business plan is huge. Are you able to prepare and complete a narrative that describes your business, that describes how you're going to fund it, that describes how you're going to build it with infrastructure, with people, what the marketplace looks like, why you're going to be successful. If you do that, it will prove to you and other th and other people that you need to show it to that you thought about this, that you're intelligent about it, that you're sober, eyes wide open. A business plan is is your template, and it's it's a it's a big deal. If you fail to produce a business plan there's a chance that you may fail to plan other things and you don't want to be in that position. Get a business plan done, talk to your accountant, make sure that the assumptions you're making and the, and the math works. Review that thing with some people who have already been in, people like me who have been in business, who have done it, who have made the mistakes already. Many, many companies fail because they fail to plan. Now, you talk about uh, professionals. Do I need to engage professionals? Oh, yeah. The first thing you want to do is engage professionals. Get a lawyer, a business lawyer, not your friend, unless he's a business lawyer. Get somebody who does this every single day and get an accountant, right? Who can help you not only with the business plan, but help you find financing and other things. I remember when I went from a, a job to a partnership. Okay, this was back in 1984. It still holds true, holds true today. And I was so excited about being in business. And I was so excited about these two guys who were my clients who wanted to back me in business that I didn't pay attention to the details. And they gave me a, an employment agreement, right? I got a big raise and all that. I was happy, but it didn't talk about things. There was no shareholders agreement. One of the first things I would urge you to do is, is have your accountant draw up an employment agreement because you are working for your company. You're an employee and, it, and you need to spell out exactly what you're getting, especially if you have a partner. And by the way, lenders are going to look at this because they're going to want to know that, OK, you're taking X amount of money out of the business and they can check that. And it's important because you're not going to take what's not there. That's just one thing. I signed the agreement right, to become a, a minority partner. And little did I know that I had, I had like zero ability to do anything but work for them. And it really hit home when I bought them out. Now, I bought them out, but it was under very, very difficult terms. So if you, if you get into a, a partnership in particular, right, and you have a minority partner, make sure you stipulate that you can buy that person out, a formula-based buyout that's fair to both sides. Because think about this, you know, 50% or more marriages break up while well, you, you get a partner. You're like, it's like a marriage and they don't all last. But you want to be able to craft that separation agreement, if you will, up front. Nobody ever goes to look, you know, in the file drawer or in their file on their computer to look at a contract unless they have to, unless things go bad. So I'm just saying, prepare for it by engaging a, a lawyer who understands all the different things that can happen. And there's a lot. You know, I, I would say that uh, your accountant should be able to not only help you with the, with the business plan numbers, but also help you find financing. They know banks, they know potential lenders. And I, I will tell you that financing is a big deal in construction. <laughs> you know, our business is crazy and you get so much of your own money tied up in the business because it's a slow pay business. It's a 60 to 90 day pay business. So think about that. Retail, you go in and buy something, the store gets the money right away. Now they might have to send, you know, the, the credit card company, but that's quick. If you put 10 guys on a job in beginning of September and they work for four weeks, that's about 40 grand you're out of pocket. Just, just for that. That's not counting you paying yourself and your employees and your overhead. And then you put your first rec in after 30 days. So they get 30 days to review it. So now you spent another 40 grand. That's 80 grand out of pocket. And it's another two weeks before you get the check. That's 100 grand. And that's for one job with 10 guys, right? So, so your accountant is, is critical in helping you understand those numbers up front so that your business plan is correct, that it's reliable, right? It's believable, it's credible. Financing is the lifeblood of your business and is a super important part of it. Now, we're going to dive really, really deep into financing in a future episode. But in general, you're going to be able to get money from lenders. Could be a bank, could be private, you know, a private person. 
it could be a friend, but I'm gonna I'm gonna warn you. <laughs> when you get to people, right? A lot of company, a lot of people start businesses and they want to bring somebody on because they have money. And that's okay if that's the only way you can do it. But when you talk about people in general, you want to bring people into your business who can add value that you can't. You don't need a duplicate of you. You need somebody who does what you what you don't do. For example, I brought a field guy on. Look, I had never installed anything in the field in my life. But man, I could sell it, right? I needed somebody who got their hands dirty, who went from job to job, and who made things happen. That was a value added to me. But if you're going to bring people in your business, don't do it to get financing. And here's why. If that person, or if, you know, two or three years down the road, that person is a 50-50 partner with you, and all they did was bring in uh, money that you now can get easily, right? You can get it because now you have equity and you can borrow it. Well, to get that person out, they own half of that business. And the only reason you brought them in is because you wanted the comfort level of, of them bringing in some cash. Again, if it's the only way to do it, half of something is better than all of nothing. But don't bring on a partner for money, okay? You bring on a partner if they're strategically built to add value to your business. Now, people in general, and we're going to get more of it, into more of this when we talk about business development. This is business startup. You need to get the overhead commensurate or consistent with your business plan. That might mean you you need to hire somebody to do your internal books, maybe a you know an, an accountant of some type, an in-house accountant. You can do that without spending a lot of money. You're probably going to need, if you're on the sales side, you're probably going to need somebody in the field. If you're on the field side, you're probably going to need somebody for sales. So how do you get them? Well, there's a couple ways. I can pull them in as a partner. No. Unless that person is worth it. Again, think about five years down the road. Your business is thriving. you got an equity position of a million bucks. Half a million is theirs. Now, maybe you wouldn't get there without them. If that person is worth it and you think that they can add that much value, then by all means, give them a honk. And, and some people do. What I did, I created a, an umbrella company and I started different businesses and I gave key people who were operators in that field 25% of the business. And, and that was the, that business model worked for me. Um, but I've also seen where people have brought on friends who brought 100 grand with them. Okay, they, they did hundred grand, and it was an easy thing to get it, but it cost them a million dollars at the end of the day. Don't put yourself in that position. Now, how else can you get a really good person without without giving them a piece of the business? Even if you overpay them, think about it. If you overpaid somebody by fifteen thousand dollars a year for five years, that's seventy five thousand bucks you overpaid. But they're not your partner. What did you save at the end of the day? If your company's worth a million bucks. You here, you now worth nine hundred twenty-five thousand because you overpaid them seventy-five grand. That's a good. That's a good way to go. Bottom line is, if you want to build a good business, you need to surround yourself with good people, and it's particularly important in the beginning, because you know the saying: you only make one first impression, and it's the same in your business, right? If you promise a customer that you're going to do a job, right? You bid it, you get to, to the right number. Now you got to produce it. You better do it. You better do it because there won't be job number two if you don't. So the importance of balancing overhead with the size of your business, with the amount of financing you have, right? With a strategic partner, uh, if at all possible, that's the way I'd start a business. Elevate, elevate, elevate. Mark Twain once said, and I'm serious. It's the clothes that make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society. The wardrobe was provided by Benchmark Clothiers, custom clothes to fit your lifestyle. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram at Benchmark Clothiers. And when you go there, tell them Dave sent you. Elevate, elevate, elevate. So now you're in business. You've answered the key question of why you're doing it. And I can't say how important that is. You've already answered that. You've answered what you're going to provide, what's going to make you different, what's going to make you special today in a year and five years. You know how you're going to do it. You're going to write a business plan. 
You're going to engage people like uh, professionals, legal and accounting firms to make sure you're legal and make sure that you know what you're planning is doable. You're going to engage people for the right reason. You're not going to engage somebody because they have some cash. That's not the right reason to do it. And we went over that. You're going to engage people who supplement your skills. If you're good in sales, you're going to get somebody who's good in the field. If you're good in the field, you're going to get somebody who's good in sales or a business mind. You're going to do things that add up and where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Where you and another person equals more than two people, you equal three. So you've done all those things right. You're in a good business. You're ready. You're challenged. The pressure's on. Now it's up to you. What are you going to do with your business? All the music for the episodes, including our theme song, Elevate, was provided by DMV producer Trey Skills. If you like what you heard, follow Trey Skills on Instagram at Trey Skills, T-R-E-Y-S-K-I-L-L-Z. That's T-R-E-Y-S-K-I-L-L-Z. So follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Elevate Industry. Check out my YouTube channel at Commercial Construction, Elevate the Industry. Visit my website, adicorp.com, A-D-I-C-O-R-P.com. Go to LinkedIn, search for David Proceda. Hit connect and follow me. Please rate, review, and comment on this episode. And I look forward to seeing you next week.